showing you here uh, takes place in one ten thousandth of a second. The whole clip takes that long. So, in other words, 135 microseconds. Uh, and so, of course, what, what starts the whole thing is a an intense electric field is building up under the atmospheric conditions that are present. Okay, and then you can see now it, what starts are these little fingers that propagate downward. I want to stop that. Little fingers that propagate downward through the atmosphere. Uh, and so the current, uh, the electrons, are generating paths through the atmosphere uh, in this breakdown process. And, uh, and that electrons propagating through those, those uh, uh, channels course, lighting up the molecules in the atmosphere. And uh, all these fingers are, fine, are spanning out, looking for something to connect with. And finally, one of them does, right here. That one is the first one that makes it. And then Kablaoui. Uh, now there's a really good open channel, an open circuit. And the current is flowing down. In fact, it's, you have to, uh, you really can't tell exactly what happens because it Overexposes here. That's not too bad. Uh, and then the rest of it, so that already took place. I mean, that's already pretty quick. Uh, and then the rest of it is just oscillations around that. There's some intensification. The other fingers have gone away, they've all dissipated. The one finger that connected first is continuing to draw current out of it uh, from upstairs. see here is a uh, that's a nice picture of uh, other lightning that's the ash coming out of a volcano is ionized and so there are all kinds of discharges going on around the plume that's pretty cool um, I wanted to show you uh, this uh, the last chapter if we get to do this um, right at the end we'll look at uh, generating an RF transmitter. Uh, Mr. Friedel, being the only honor student, will assist me in making an RF transmitter so we can demonstrate it in class. Uh, we, we don't do very much circuit theory in this class, unfortunately. Uh, chapter 9, I think, in the book does go into quite a bit of circuit theory, and uh, enough so that you can understand how the transmitter works. And uh, this is an example of a receiver. Uh, radio receiver made out of a nano tube. The nano tube ends here. It's connected to the substrate over here. And uh, it, this is probably a pretty relatively big nano tube, meaning that it's probably multiple walls, multiple tubes inside of each other. Uh, I don't know the exact length of this one. Uh, uh, now they're going to turn this into a receiver. You can see the tube here. Now they're going to expose this to an oscillating electric field, uh, an RF field and change the frequency a little bit until they get resonance. So this is like a simple harmonic oscillator. It's damped and driven. And the driving frequency is now going to be shifted until you get resonance. So you can't see it anymore because it's doing this. Those all have to do, of course, with um, um, applications. And actually, the demos in E&M are great. I mean, the, the mechanics demos are pretty good. But I'm going to have some really cool demos for you this term. I, I really enjoy the E&M demos. Uh, so there are going to be more of those. I'm, I'm, I had some already set up, but I'm probably going to postpone them for Monday on the triple electric series and electroscopes and things like that. Uh, and I've got a nice little handheld Vandegraaff generator and stuff. A lot of good stuff. Uh, now, in relation to that, though, this, in fact, I think I'm going to come back to that. Uh, let's briefly go over some of the, uh, again, by way of review, some of the topics that we have to consider here. No, let's put it this away. Turn up. Hello. Thank you. 
assists. It's upside down. There we go. Okay. So now in your reading, as part of the review, uh, something that was new in this book, uh, in in the UNM that wasn't introduced before, were the hello four causes. Now the four a cause is something that it's. Uh, uh, a, a matter of dependence. Something is dependent on something else uh, for its existence or for a change. So an effect is dependent on a cause. And we categorize those four kinds of causes, or, or generally we have four ways of speaking about causes. And uh, so he lists them in the book, and we're going to talk about these a little bit more as we go along. Generally, four different ways of talking about how something, one thing, depends on another. Okay, now, a good e illustration of this is to take the example of a house. We could talk about the causes of a house. And one, or dependence. What does a house depend on for its existence? So the material cause of a house would be the stuff that you make the house out of, that which it's made from. So would be like uh, for a house, the cause of a house would be, for example, wood, bricks, nails, you know, anything that you use for the siding, roofing, that kind of stuff. Those are, the, that, those are the material causes of a house. And what we mean is that the house, the existence of the house depends on having materials, of course, in order to make it from. The word material there, remember, emphasizes is really the same as physical. What we mean when we're talking about the material causes or the physical causes, material refers to changeable. And the material causes of a house, like the wood, the wood is useful for making a house precisely because you can take it and put it into different forms and put it together in a different way. Okay, put, Construct a roof, construct the walls. And so it has the possibility of being reformed. Now the second part is what I just said there, form. When we talk about the form of a house would be, well, it has a roof, it has four walls, it has a floor, it keeps the weather out, it's a shelter. So the, 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 the form or is, the formal cause is, what do I do with the materials to put them together in that fashion, okay? So that would be having, having a roof, having walls. Now the efficient cause of a house would be also the agent. The efficient cause would be the carpenter or the, the home builder, the guy who built the house. He takes the materials and puts them into the correct form. So he is the agent that accomplishes that. Now the final cause would be what is the purpose of the house? Well, you build a house for shelter, shelter from the weather. That gives you an example. Now, the house is an artificial thing. Remember, we've talked before about, I've encouraged you to think about natural things. But in this case, the, I use the four causes of an artificial thing to help illustrate the meaning of the four causes because it's pretty clear in this. But you can also have the four causes associated with natural things, natural changes. Yeah, Mr. Dowdle. So for the final cause, is that more of like a human construct? Well, for an artificial thing, artificial things, always have a purpose that for man, right? Yeah. We, we have a reason for doing that, and the reason is the final cause for an artificial thing. But, and, and right, so exactly right, for an artificial thing. But now we, let's, we're going to talk about natural things, though. Okay, so now we'll talk about the four causes for a natural thing. Okay. But you're right, you're exactly right. Artificial things, in fact, exist only in the mind as such computer exists only in the mind as such. In nature, it's a bunch of substances wired, hooked up and wired together in a certain way, right? But the purpose of it, the use of it as a computer for doing this, for example, is in the mind, the understanding of it. And uh, different people have different purposes for the same object. You know, what is that? It's a knife or a screwdriver or, you know, depends on how you use it, right? A hammer, this could be a hammer, it's not a very good hammer, it could be a hammer. So, but it's intended, you know, 
its best use <laughs> is as a stylus as a pen, but it could be used for other, other purposes. Okay, but now let's consider the four causes for a natural thing. So in that same sense, we have material and formal causes. And the formal cause, the form, form, the form of the thing is what it actually is. And the material cause is what it potentially is. Remember, physical things are a combination of act and potency, or actuality and a potentiality, because physical things can change. They're actually one way, but they can be another way. And that's what we mean when we're talking about the, the formal cause and the material cause. So the actuality and the potentiality are the material, the form, formal and material causes of the physical thing. The efficient cause would be the thing that actually causes the change. And then the final cause would also be understood as a tendency. Things have a tendency to go that way, an internal ten tendency for the object to act in a certain way. That's a final cause. That's an it's an immediate cause. Okay. Now with with each of these also we talk we talk about both proximate and remote causes. The proximate cause is what's immediately present. The remote cause would be something that may be farther away. So for an, an artificial thing. Uh, the uh, proximate cause for the carpenter is to get paid, <laughs> but the remote cause was the person wanted somebody paid him to make the thing to have a shelter, right? So you can see that there may be a, a sequence of these, a chain of these. Okay, now let's consider going back to our discussion of impetus as a cause. Impetus as a cause of locomotion. How would you rate impetus in this fashion in terms of the four causes and whether it's proximate or remote. As a cause of locomotion, where does impetus fit in? It's an efficient cause. Is it proximate or remote? It's proximate. What's the remote cause of locomotion? The force, which is also an efficient cause, but a remote efficient cause, because the force gives the body impetus, which causes it to move. So this may seem kind of strange to talk about things this way, but again, this, is, this is allows us to talk about things moving from the most generic, the broadest big view, and moving down. So whenever you ask a question about something, what is something? What you should start off with is the biggest view possible, the broadest thing that you can talk about, and then work your way down. And that's exemplified in the game of 20 questions that we did last term and that, that you'll be doing on Monday. Again, another kind of 20 questions. Uh, 20 questions, the first thing you want to determine is, is it a substance or a property, right? So that's the, that's the most generic thing. What is color? Okay, well, is it a substance or a property? Well, it's a property. Let's take the big view and you work your way down. So among the properties, then we have the nine categories. Is it quantity, quality, relation, action, reception, so forth? Is it intrinsic or ex extrinsic? Well, color is intrinsic. So it's quantity or quality. So then the next question is, is it a quantity? No, so it must be a quality. And now you need to break down the quality. Quality is an enormous category. So, you, But again, you try to, try to break it down in some way. And one way to do that is some of the properties are directly sensible by us. Uh, the color, texture, temperature, sound, those things are directly sensible by us. Others are less directly sensible. Impetus is a property that's not directly sensible by us. You can tell a body has impetus by watching it move, right? That's not a, you don't have a, a, a sense organ that shows you the degree of impetus, the intensity of the impetus that a body has. So some of the properties, some of the qualities are directly sensible, others are in, indirectly knowable by us through watching something to determine that it has a power to act that way, for example, force. Okay, so in this case, color is directly sensible. So we, now we've narrowed down the quality category, and you can break it down. Okay, which of the five senses are connected to it? Well, you can determine that it's sight and so forth, okay? So you see the scheme of that. Start with the biggest possible thing that you can say about it and work your way down. We do that with impetus. What is impetus? Impetus is a property, category, of, oh, and specifically a power, which means it's a property, in the category of quality. And that, so we started with the biggest description of it, and now it caught of a massive body, so that means it's, now we're getting more specific, that causes it to move. So you see the procedure. 
So if somebody asks you, what is something, start with, what's the most generic thing I can say about it? And then work your way down to the specific. Okay? Okay. So, and that's what we're doing here with, with causes now. Uh, we, we start with the most generic, well, is it a material cause, a formal cause, an efficient cause, or a final cause? Is it proximate or remote? We're talking about really big things, really big scheme, big picture, and work your way down. Okay. Okay, now, in, in Newtonian mechanics, you weren't seeing this. No, that's right. It, well, you were seeing it. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm getting confused here. I'll get straightened out here in a minute. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is, is the imperiometric. Is the combination. It's the symbolic system uh, that we identify as modern physics now, and it's what is what's most clearly understood in relation to modern physics is what most people identify as modern physics. And that is the core of, of the modern scientific method, is the symbolic system that is modern physics. Modern physics drives the other sciences. It's the, it is the base science. It's the base of all our knowing and thinking, our understanding of the physical world. Okay. Now, since Newton, um, Newton came up with what we now call Newtonian mechanics. And Newtonian mechanics would be the, f or Newtonian dynamics also known as, Newtonian mechanics would be the first clear example of the imperiometric method in history. And it's something that did not exist before. Nothing like it existed before Newton did that. Uh, so it is qualitatively a different thing. And it unleashed the modern scientific revolution that we're still living in right now. Uh, so Newtonian mechanics consists of two things. Newton's second law. I mean, if we're getting down to the nutshell here, getting down to the nutshell, that, that the net force causes a change in momentum. And this ha deals with massive bodies, right? Newtonian mechanics deals with massive bodies only. Uh, and, and the second part, so part one, and part two is the force law. <coughs> It's an imperiometric representation of that piece, the force. You, given that, those two pieces, Newton's second law and then the description of the force law, what you have is a differential equation that you're going to solve. And so the governing equation or the equation of motion is that thing. That's the first part. You start with given the force law and Newton's second law, put them together, and now it's purely mathematical problem. Just solve it. And what you're wanting to do in that is to solve for the position as a function of time given the initial conditions, given the initial position and the initial velocity. So taking the force law, combining it with Newton's second law, and then the initial conditions giving you the, the solution. That's the, goal. That's the goal. And we're going to do this over and over and over again. We did it a lot in the first semester. You're going to do a lot more of it as, as you go along. That's the basic idea of Newtonian mechanics. We're going to do something different in this semester now. And, and we'll describe that here uh, today as we go along. You'll start seeing we're going to be doing something different. Specifically, we're focusing on the force law. Uh, and we're going to deal with a specific kind of force law, which is the forces generated by electricity and magnetism. So the goal of this semester pretty much will be to spell out that force law. And occasionally we will consider, well, what if we have a charged particle moving in an electric and magnetic field? How is it going to move? Okay, so we'll solve Newton's equation. But most of the time we're just going to be writing down the force law. How do you write down the force law? Um, and so that's our concern here. Imperiometrically, that's our concern um, with this semester. Okay. Um, but now to get to that, we need, we need an understanding in order to get to the force law, we need an understanding. And we, we were first introduced to this last semester when we took up the study of gravity, where we had one body uh, was able is able to generate a force on a second body, an attractive force. And Newton realized that the, the magnitude of that force was proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And the uh, the two bodies exert the same intensity of force on each other. It's always attractive 
uh, and that the masses involved here are, in fact, can be taken to be the inertial masses that we talked about in Buridan's law. Uh, and then there's this gravitational, this uh, universal gravitational constant, uh, uh, which uh, uh, the magnitude of which is, you know, the reason for that magnitude, we still don't know why is it that value, but it, it's a measurable value. Okay, and so now you could write this, write down Newton's second law and solve it. For example, suppose we have, if I drawn this in one dimension, let's, let's put the Earth here and the Moon here, and the Earth is much more massive than the Moon, so it's not going to move very much. So we're going to neglect the motion of the Moon, and let's call this distance x, and we want to write down Newton's second law for this problem. This was actually on the test, uh, the final at the end. Uh, so the equation of motion then is that. that. That's actually the answer to one of the test questions, the one on the final. So you're just going to solve this problem. This is not one you know how to solve, right? The force depends on one or the square root of the distance. You don't know how to solve that one. At least you haven't learned in this class how to solve it. It's really kind of tricky, and you can't do it simply by just straightforward integrating twice because if you tried to apply the integral, integrate this twice with respect to time, you, it involves knowing the solution already. That is, you, in order to integrate the right-hand side, you have to know what x of t is to do the integral. And you don't know yet what x of t is. Okay. So now this, let's re remind ourselves what this is. A differential equation is different than an algebraic equation that you were used to solving. You know, you solve for two variables, x and y. Uh, which involved the crossing of two straight lines or something like that, or quad, uh, solve a quadratic solution, uh, quadratic equation. You're looking for two values of x that zero a quadratic polynomial, for example. The, those are algebraic equations. This is a different kind of equation than what you're used to dealing with. Both sides are functions of time. And what you're looking for is a solution, x of t, whose second derivative is inversely relate, related to the square of itself, and that that would be true for all time. So in other words, you have the right hand, the, the uh, left hand side. The left hand side is a function of time, and the right hand side is a function of time. And these must equal each other for all time. So this is of its character different than what you're used to solving. You need to find a function of time that satisfies this relation for all time. Okay, and so we came up with this process of, I'll give you a solution, and you can check it out just by direct substitution. Just plug it in, and then you want to see if the left-hand side can equal the right-hand side for all time. That's, you know, that's trying to help you to see at least the nature of a differential equation. That's what the direct substitution is. It's not a way of teaching you how to solve these equations. It's trying to get you to recognize what is a solution and what's not a solution. Okay, so that force law is, is important, and we encountered different kinds of force laws uh, of, of basic character. One was just where the net force is zero, right? That's one force law. There is no force acting, in which case the body undergoes uniform linear translation. Another force law that we encountered would be, for example, um, this one, which is a constant independent of position or time. And this would be the force experienced by a body near the surface of the Earth, so that the strength of the force doesn't depend much on the distance above the floor. And so this is a constant force, okay, and we learn how to solve those. That leads to uniform linear acceleration. Okay. It, has a, it causes a constant rate of change of the impetus, the momentum. We encountered another force now where the force actually depends on the position. And that was Hooke's law. And we learned how to solve that. This gives rise to oscillatory motion. We also had a force law, and this one is very different because it depends on the velocity. It depends on the time dependence. It depends on the velocity of the thing. And that makes it uh, not conservative force. It means that, that, that the total energy will not be conserved the work done by this force depends on the path. So we're going to put that one aside. We're going to put that over to the side and come back to consider that later. We're looking, now the final one that we considered last term was this, 
is uh, that one, the, the uh, universal gravitation one. So those are the basic kinds, really not very many when you look at them. Uh, the conservative forces then uh, uh, were characterized by having but with the work done by a force over a path doesn't depend that depends only on the endpoints doesn't depend on the path taken from A to B, uh, and we'll we'll uncover other conditions related to that different ways of expressing the same thing. And one of them was that a closed path, a path that goes somewhere and then comes back on itself, does no network. The network done independent of the route taken, uh, the network is zero. That's characteristic of a, of a conservative force. Okay, now. It's clear enough to see how the, how the spring works. That's easy enough to understand uh, because the spring is in contact with the body. But this gravitational force is funny because it involves action over a distance in some way. Newton uh, neglected to think about very much. I mean, he actually did think about it some, but he didn't make very much progress on understanding how is it that one body, namely the Earth, can cause a force on this body when they're not in contact with each other. Well, uh, and so we, we started considering that, and that's the subject of this other uh, piece I want to show you here, uh, to show you how much confusion there is on this subject. Uh, I hope you can hear him because what he says is important. The series that brings you I should a wondrous variety of research in physics, chemistry, and mathematics here at the University of California at San Diego. This series has been developed so we can share the excitement of exploration and discovery, and the promise which that discovery holds for our future. I'm Mark Themans, Dean of UCSD's Division of Physical Sciences, and I'm proud to dedicate this series. I should skip, I should skip that part. So he, he already starts off with a confusion, right? He equated two things, nothing and empty space, right? Uh, and so we, we need to recognize the importance uh, that we really need to worry about nothing in that sense. We need to recognize the importance of this medium that permeates, that is, that exists between massive bodies. Now we focused on the massive bodies. And that, so in some sense, the first book, book one of PFR, is about, is the book of impetus. That could be the uh, subtitle for that book. The book that we're going to consider in this term could be called Impetus oops, Meets Plana. What happens when impetus of a massive charged body interacts with the plana? Okay, now the plana before, when we were looking at that gravitational problem, the problem, the, the plana comes in, and the way we discussed, so we, let's review this. Let's suppose we have a massive body that is sitting inside of the plana. The plana is the substance between massive bodies, it's a physical substance, and it has properties like all physical substances, and the primary property of all physical substances is quantity. There is a distance between my hands, and that is a property of the plana between my hands. So that's one of the properties that's easily revealed. It's right in front of you. Other properties include the fact that I can see through this plana. It's a medium through which light propagates and gravity propagates. So we considered that propagation here. So let, let's talk a little bit more about his confusion there. We have a word that we use to describe plana, which is vacuum or space. But the problem with those two words is that they connote an emptiness, a nothingness. 
they connote, and he even makes that confusion. He equates it with nothing. Right? Nothing is not, does not exist. Nothing cannot exist. Let's go think about, for example, uh, silence. Silence is an absence of sound. It's a, silence does not actually exist. It's not an existing thing. We have a word and a concept of silence that is an absence of sound. And in fact, we give it a kind of existence that it doesn't have in the physical world by giving it a name, right? Silence, we give it a name, we give it a word to describe the concept in our mind. That already gives it an existence it doesn't have in the physical world. Darkness is an absence of light. It's not an ex actually existing physical thing. Darkness is an absence of a physically existing thing. Nothing is a complete absence of existence that's what nothing means. Complete absence of existence. And so it's clear that nothing cannot exist. It's a concept in the mind. It's a being of reason. We give it a word, and by giving it a name, we're actually elevating it in a way and possibly confuse ourselves because it's, we might think it actually exists in the world. But nothing, as you understand, that's the primary meaning of nothing. And as such, it cannot exist. So space we have a problem because we want to call it nothing but because that's what space kind of connotes to us in, in a way is the absence of something all right but better to say it's the it's there are no massive bodies here okay now space has two different meanings also for us actually multiple meanings but two two basic ones i want to consider here the first is physical space it is what is present here in this room between us is where we're our places are located in this space Okay, and there's space between us. Now there's space between my hands. Now there's nothing between my hands, right? Now there's something between my hands. It has extension. Physical space. Mathematical space is an abstraction. Based on that physical space, what are we focusing on when we talk about mathematical space? Remember, abstraction does away with properties and focuses only on a particular property. What property is our focus when we talk about mathematical space. That your extension. That's it, quantity. And that's it. We're throwing out all other properties in our minds when we're considering mathematical space. And that occurs in Newton's law here, that, uh, that force law and that equation that I wrote down here in the box there. Space is kind of in the background of this. It's revealed in a way by x that you're measuring the position of a body relative to some marker or something. So there's an extension. And that's all you're thinking about, of the plana, of the stuff that's there, is just that. Nothing else. You neglect everything else. And in that force law, the 1 over x squared, 1 over distance squared force law, instantaneous propagation of gravity. So if I were to somehow magically delete one mass, second mass would know about it right away. Its force would no longer exist on it. That's contained in Newton's law of gravity. Okay? But that's not physical um, because they're not in contact with each other. And that extended, that sort of non-indirect, that sort of interaction over distance doesn't happen because physical bodies need contact in order to do that. Okay. So mathematical space then is an excessive abstraction. It's something that we've gotten wandered into. We need to remind ourselves of the concrete world that physical space does not exist as mathematical space. Mathematical space, for example, you could have completely empty mathematical space. Nothing's there. Physical space does not exist independent of physical things. There is no physical, there is no physical space that's independent of physical things. The physical plana exists with things in it and interacting with each other. There's no uh, there's no situation where you have emptiness, right? It can't, can't be. Mr. Dowd. Does that mean like the universe has a boundary then? Well, that's a good question, but uh, and that's remote from us. So how do we answer questions like that, generally speaking? We start with the things that are around us, 
that are no easily and best known by us? And then we work out. Okay, so that's a difficult question to answer, right? And it involves potentially finding, looking for a boundary, right, far away from us, which involves extending our senses and doing things that are difficult. So I don't know the answer to the question um, because I don't know any sensible answer to the question. It, it, that's a difficult question, I think. But the way to answer questions like that is to start with those things that are knowable by us. So in other words, we start with the mechanics and the e and M, and we work our way progressively to those sorts of things. So to answer, I don't know the answer, to, but I can tell you how to answer a question like that, at least in strategy, how to answer a question like that. You can't answer a question like that entirely by doing it in your mind, right? You have to rely on your senses uh, and understand the nature of the physical things around us. It is possible for us in the imperiometric method to get so caught up in the system, axiomatic symbolic system to play games in there that don't reflect reality. And that's the danger that we have to, that, that is one of the dangers, the supreme danger we have to be careful about. Okay, so these two things exist, these two bodies exist inside of another substance which has extension but doesn't have mass. It has other properties, and we're going to start looking at those properties. It's a physical substance, meaning it's changeable. And one way it changes is that this, um, this body can alter the plana surrounding it because it's a massive body. And that alteration is what we call a gravitational field. It's a property of the plana, and it's being altered. Now, the other characteristic of the plana that's been altered is it passes along that alteration to neighboring plana. So this field propagates outward, and as it propagates outward, it thins out in the sense that it gets weaker, like the area. So the strength of that field is diminishing like one over the square of the area, uh, one over the square of the distance, because it's thinning out over the area of that sphere of representing the uh, propagating field. So it thins out. Now this is something that's constantly happening. That mass is constantly pumping out this alteration. And then it propagates outward and it finds another massive body. And now the plana that has been altered will produce a force on that second body. So the plana has the power to cause a force, but only if it's been altered itself in such a way as to have a, a field present in it. And the intensity of that force is proportional to the field strength that's present at that location. Okay. So it then produces a force. And of course, this second body is also propagating its influence outward. And that produces also a force then of equal strength in the opposite direction in the attractive force. The speed of propagation is the speed of light. And this realization was first uh, well understood by Einstein. Uh, in his development of the general theory of relativity, which is a theory of gravity, uh, which takes into account the fact that the medium between massive bodies is a physical thing, and it does stuff. And so, in some sense, Einstein is going back into the concrete world and correcting an excessive abstraction of Newton. Newton is talking about forces that can propagate instantaneously. That's not physical. Einstein goes in and wants to say there's something between these bodies it has physical properties. We need to understand how that works. And so that's the general theory of relativity, the gra theory of gravitation, Okay, which has been extremely successful. Yeah, Mr. McKenna. So if mass one was moving at a very high velocity, yeah. would gravity undergo a Doppler effect? Well, yeah, in principle, yeah, something like that. That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. If, if, it were a, if it had a frequency associated with it. Right? Okay. So I guess you would have to say that M, if M1 were oscillating, vibrating, it would produce waves, and with, which would have a frequency of the oscillation of the. And then, if that body were moving, it uh, also say in a direction perpendicular to the oscillation towards this one, there would be something like a Doppler shift, you know, a Doppler effect. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we'll study the, that in a little bit simpler case, which is the electrical analog to this. Okay. So. Um, Okay, now, this same sort of thing uh, happens with a new kind of force that we're going to, start, that we're going to explore 
uh, actually two forces that are interrelated we're going to study. And that is we're going to, going to recognize that some massive bodies can acquire a property called charge. And actually there are two kinds of charge. There's a positive kind and a negative kind. And we call them positive and negative, but already we're potentially confusing ourselves. It's a little bit like what we did when we were talking about displacements. I could move right or I could move left. Those are different kinds of displacements. Now, they do oppose each other in some sense, because if I move right two steps and then move left two steps, I'm back to where I started from. Right? To encapsulate that into a really simple mathematical system, I talk about plus and minus motion. I talk about two steps right is plus two, two steps left is negative two. But you never move negative two steps. You can't. You can only move positive steps in some direction. Right? What we've done is to extend number to include a negative thing, negative numbers. That's a being of reason. Right? They're, no, they're not two, they're negative two coconuts or negative two dollars. You know, if, if I overdraw my bank account and I go into the bank and I say I want please give me those negative two dollars that are in my bank account. Right? They, they say, no, you owe us money. It has to go the other way. Right? Negative is a being of reason in that sense. Okay. Now the same thing is going to happen here with this positive and negative charge. They're two different kinds of charge, but we can get away with calling the positive and negative for the following reason that if we superimpose them, that there's an apparent cancellation between their effects. That is, I can take a body which is charged positive and a body which is charged negative actually bring them in touch with each other and they'll transfer the charge to each other and neutralize them. The positive and negative are, are not, we call them positive and negative charge, just be aware of that, that it's, it's too simple to say that they're just like positive and negative numbers. And you can get into that when you study quantum chromodynamics, which is the strong interaction that holds the nucleons together, the protons and the neutrons together in the nucleus, because there's a strong repulsion among the protons to push them away. Something's got to hold them together, and it's actually very strong. Short range, but very strong. And the understanding of that force is having three charges. <coughs> you can't just express that as positive and negative, right? Positive and negative means a lot. It's, it's an interesting effect that we can take these positive charges and negative charges, put them together, and they appear to cancel in their effects. But it's an oversimplification to simply say they're just plus and minus. That would be a, the wrong thing to do. Okay. So we have a charge, and it will also influence a, what I should say is a charged body. Okay. A charged massive body. So let's be charge does not exist independent of a massive body, independent of a substance. It's a property of a substance. Charge does not exist by itself. Just like mass does not exist by itself. It's a body with mass, a body with charge. But I'm going to start saying occasionally, and I should try to resist this, especially in an introductory class, and also to remind myself, because I constantly need reminding, charge is not a separate substance. Charge is a property of a substance. So I should talk about charged massive body. That would be the precise way of des describing it. Planet itself does not hold charge. Just like it does not have mass, the planet itself does not have charge. It's not a property of a planet. Okay. okay, so a charged massive body generates an alteration of the planet. It alters the planet in its neighborhood, in its vicinity, and that alteration propagates outward in the same way, very very similar to what we just saw with the gravity. It weakens in the same way, so the force diminishes like 1 over the square of the distance from that body. And if it encounters another body, so this is Q1 and Q2, the alteration in that planet can cause a force. Now we have something different, though. If the two types of charge, remember we had two types of charge, if these charges are of the same type, then we have a repulsive interaction. It will actually cause a repulsion. And the force then is, is proportional to the product of the two charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Similar to gravity, but a little different. And I'm going to put out a little proportionality constant here that we'll come to discuss later. Okay, now this encapsulates a lot of things. 
If the two charges are of the same type, that is, they're both what we call positive, then it's repulsive, or both negative, it's also repulsive. But if they're opposite types, then we get an attractive interaction. So now we have something different than gravity. If we take two positive charge, a, a positive charge and a negative charge and put them close together, and now we have another charge out here, it will see almost no force because the fields generated by these two charges are in the opposite and they almost cancel each other. And the farther away you get, the better the cancellation is. So this is called a dipole. And the electric field around the dipole is pretty weak as you get far away. Okay, that's my reminder that I've got five minutes. See, I'm just getting warmed up. Okay, so. Uh, this dipole has, the field generated by this dipole is weaker than the field generated by a single isolated charge, and that's because it has a cancellation, a, a canceling, partially canceling charge right next to it, okay? And the, and the degree of, at, at which they can cancel each other is that, is that separation between each other, if, if, that they can't cancel each other, is the separation between each other, okay? So we'll study the dipole field. That's one of the things that we will study, okay? So the electric field, just like the gravitational fields, superimposed, and just like the gravitational field, which had an intensity and a direction associated with it, we're now going to talk about an electric field as having an intensity and a direction associated with it. So the electric field generated by charge, by the first charge, is going to be directed away. If, if this is a positive charge, the electric field is going to be directed away from it. If it's a negative charge, it's going to be directed towards it. The electric field gives us then, this is the electric field generated by one. So the force on two, because of one, is the charge on that second body times that electric field. So we can say that then the electric field uh, is like a force per charge. It's present in the plana even if there is no other charge there. The field is present even if you don't have a second body. But when you put a second charged body present there, automatically that plana will now exert a force on that body. This is called the electrostatic force. And we're not calling it just a strict electric force. And the reason is I'm going to, why I'm going to use attach static to it in some sense. And that's because, I mean, there is, we have taken into account some of the propagation time, but this force law here um, doesn't take into account the motion of the first body. Right? If that, if, let's suppose that first body exists and it propagates the plana outward and now there's a force acting on this body. But suppose during the interval I somehow magically delete that first body. The plana will still have that alteration. It takes a finite time for that propagation to occur. The distance is small, that's really short time. But you know, it takes what eight minutes for the gravity for light to travel from the sun to the earth, uh, and so that would take that time. So if that body is deleted while that's being propagated, this body will still experience a force. Okay, uh, but then there's this. Now it catches up and it goes away. Okay, now this doesn't take that into account, right? This just says if that first body goes away, then the force stops right there. So. That's what is meant by the electrostatic, is it doesn't take into account the propagation. And so this is present if you have a body that's not going to move and, and go away. And this body is not going to move or go away. And so the, it neglects the motion of these bodies. Everybody's got to stay put. Don't move. Put the charges out there and leave them. And we'll measure the forces. Nobody move. That's electrostatic, OK? Now we're going to take into account we're going to go through a progression in this course. We'll start with the electrostatic, we'll do the magnetostatic, and then we'll start adding some of the time dependence in. Uh, we're going to do uh, magnetic induction, and then we'll do uh, uh, further uh, relaxation of the static approximation. We'll end up in chapter six, five, I can't remember it right now, sorry. Two, three, four, six. We'll end up in chapter six with the fully dynamical expression of this and magnetism. That's our goal in this, which are Maxwell's equations. 
which have the, the full Monty. Everything is moving around and nobody has to sit still. We can all move around and we get the propagation of the fields and we can, and the end result is the force law. Now we can, we've got all these electric and magnetic fields flying around. We can put a charge there, move it, and watch the force and watch how it moves, okay? So the goal of this course is to produce the force law in Newton's laws, Newton's equation. And we're going to spend a lot of time on it. So this is, this is the first one. And this is called the electrostatic force law, which represents two charges just stuck, don't move, don't let them move much anyway, move slowly, so that the propagation time is negligible. You don't have to worry about how long it takes to propagate. Yes, sir, Mr. Bowles. When you talk about um, charges, are you talking about electrons, or is it kind of? Well, we don't know at this point, okay? So, but what we're actually referring to are charged bodies, and when I, when I bring in the demonstration on Monday, you'll see you can take, but you know this, you know, you can walk on a carpet and you are a charged massive body, okay? Now, we could associate that with parts, but what you know is that you are charged and you know your hair sticks up and you can touch things and get shocked and that's what you know. So start with that. Massive bodies can acquire charge. Now we can associate those with parts of us. And those parts can be stripped off and maybe exist on their own as separate substances, but then it's another charged massive body. So doing that, we know ultimately that there are both electrons and protons or, or ions that have that are atoms with electrons missing. So we have two different types, the positive and the negative. But that's something that's really, again, 